dedicated to blockchain and crypto assets. And I'm very pleased that we could co-organize this event with our colleagues from the UC Berkeley Institute for Data Science. I will be assisted as moderator to this event by Anne Hellman, who is the deputy head of unit of the EU Commission Directorate General for Communication Networks, Content and Technology. Annie is currently an EU fellow here at the Institute of European Studies. In fact, today's speaker, uh, Lucas Repa, uh, was also an EU fellow here in Berkeley at our institute in 2017, 2018, and became a good friend of our institute, if I may say so. And, and during his stay on the Berkeley campus, uh, Lucas explored the impact of fintech on competition in banking, as well as the relevance of initial coin offerings for crowdfunding startups. Um, Lucas is originally from Austria, has a legal background, is a qualified attorney of law at the Bar of Vienna, and later also obtained a Master of Laws from the European College in Bruges. And since 2003, he has worked as a senior policy officer at the European Commission. Lucas has led antitrust investigations into card payment networks, in retail banking and in insurance and in capital markets. Since December 2018, Lucas heads a legal department tasked with industrial policy for startup innovation and blockchain technologies. Lucas is involved in the EU markets in crypto assets regulation and setting up a pan-European regulatory sandbox for blockchain in exploring the potential of programmable digital money for industry 4.0 and in the European Central Bank's Digital Euro project. So all very exciting projects and we're thrilled and to have Lucas here with us to tell us more about all these projects he's currently involved in. Uh, Lucas prepared for us a presentation that will take about half an hour um, and that will be followed by a Q&A. So if you have any questions uh, for Lucas, you are all encouraged to post them in the chat function on Zoom, and then uh, Annie and I will pass on a selection of your questions to Lucas after his presentation. But now, please relax and enjoy the presentation that Lucas Reba prepared for us, a presentation entitled Blockchain and Crypto Assets, the European Union's Policy and Regulation. Please join me in welcoming Lucas Reba. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jeroen, for having me. It's a pleasure to be back at UC Berkeley at the Institute for European Studies, where I've had the privilege and the pleasure to conduct research as a fellow four years ago, meanwhile. And, uh, under different circumstances, this was before COVID. Uh, and I'm very glad that it is now again possible to visit the campus, to be here, and to have a lively and engaging discussion. So thank you very much. What I would like to do um, in the next 20, 30 minutes is to give you a bit of an, an insight into how the European Union tries to make most of blockchain innovation in an industrial policy perspective and a regulatory perspective. So I will give you a little bit of an overview of how we support research and development, how we research uh, blockchain technologies. I will then uh, go over and pivot uh, to give you an overview of the regulatory framework. And then I would also like to discuss with you a little bit the environmental questions that use of certain, I underline certain blockchain technologies raise. I'll start the presentation if this works. Yeah, so the blockchain policies, the policies of the European Commission for blockchain are built around several pillars, if I may say, and I've tried to list them up. We believe that the public sector plays an important role as a trailblazer for innovation. You know that the public sector in the European Union is much larger than in, in America, uh, and therefore leveraging this public sector to promote technological innovation is very, very relevant to us. Yeah. Second, support the research and development. It's not EU specific. You also see in the United States of America that technological innovation very much is carried by support by research and innovation 
coming from the academic, but in particular also the private sector in Europe, research and development comes in particular from the public sector, the support. We're trying to close the knowledge gap, the knowledge gap that still exists about what blockchain technologies are all about, and to help also universities train uh, students in blockchain technologies, and then we support global cooperation. Finally, very importantly, and this is where I would like to do a little bit of a deep dive with you, because this is an area where Europe is, I think, leading, is the regulatory area where the European Union has proposed very comprehensive and encompassing uh, regulatory frameworks for cryptocurrencies in particular, in order to protect investors and the idea of creating regulatory sandboxes to uh, help innovators and startups understand our regulatory framework. So with that being said, I'll jump into the first part of the presentation, where I would like to give you an overview of our blockchain policies that are of a non-regulatory nature. So all in all, and this is a very recent count we have done, we've realized that over the last five years, the European Commission, which is you know, the executive branch of the European Union has invested, spent almost 347 million euros uh, of money in research and innovation that relates to some extent to distributed ledger technologies. It's not only distributed ledger technologies, but projects that involve the use of blockchain technologies. And you can see here that this is very comprehensive. It does not, for instance, focus on the use of blockchain technologies in finance, which you might expect. This is very US typical. In the USA, blockchain technologies are really just used essentially for cryptocurrencies, digital assets. In Europe, research went in all areas. We wanted to understand whether you could, could use the power of distributed ledgers also for areas that are non-financial. And you see this is quite well spread in the manufacturing sector. In sustainability, energy and transport, also quite a significant about 30 5% of our research went into the energy sector where distributed ledger technologies have an interesting potential and in food security along supply chains. Yep. Uh, the joint research center of the European Union in ISPR has a quite significant capacity, own capacity to test distributed ledger technologies. And uh, they have 500 virtual nodes uh, and have the possibility to test, and they're doing this to test different blockchain technologies and provide very objective assessment of their potential for innovation in the European Union. We promote also academic skills for distributed ledger technologies. One of our largest uh, projects here is to support universities in almost all of the European Union. Uh, this is a very comprehensive uh, project. It's called the SHARES partnership between 23 uh, university academic partners uh, in 13 countries that boost the capacity of academics, of professors to teach uh, about blockchain technologies and to support scholarships for students that want to uh, conduct research in the area of distributed ledger technologies. And I'm coming now to um, how we want to use the public sector as a trailblazer for blockchain innovation in the European Union. So, four years ago, at one of our digital conferences, the ministers of the 27 EU member states came together and decided that, contrary to other areas of technological innovation, we do not want to start investing only at the national level and then later on try to connect what we build at the national level. We want this time from the outset to develop something at the pan-European level. That was the idea. So these governments came together and signed a partnership agreement to build a blockchain infrastructure, a generic blockchain infrastructure only for the public sector to support cross-border cooperation. And that is the European blockchain partnership and it's building this European blockchain services infrastructure. And what you see here on the left side is the nodes that we currently have in the test network. This is in a test stage, and we want to go into operation quite soon in, in the summer uh, of this year. 
So we have we are in a pilot phase. The network has 30 nodes and it covers the 27 EU member states, Norway and Liechtenstein. What is probably interesting for our discussion of reuse, the use cases that we are trying to support with this network. Technology is only as good as the use cases that it can support. And one area of focus for this network is self-sovereign identity and digital credentials, in particular university diplomas. So the power of blockchain is really to authenticate documents, to authenticate data and transactions, record them immutably on a distributed ledger. And if these universities issue academic credentials and hash them on the blockchain, this is a digital fingerprint. It's a proof that the academic credential is authentic and it facilitates later on the exchange of the credentials across border. If a student, let's say from, from Ireland, would like to go to Spain to study there or would like to apply for work at an employer later on, they could show these academic credentials in a digital wallet, and they would be authenticated on this trans-European blockchain network. We also want to put European social security pass on the blockchain, and our customs authorities are, are quite advanced in developing a use case for value-added taxes. Nope, it's not on. Can you push the next one? Yeah. That uh, another area of interest that I wanted to uh, just flag to you is the use of blockchain technologies for intellectual property protection. So the European uh, uh, Institute for uh, Inter Intellectual Properties uh, has currently uh, under development three types of use cases where blockchain technologies will be deployed. Uh, the first one is copyrights. So in copyrights, contrary to the United States of America, in Europe, we do not have uh, a central register where you could download a piece of work, art, music uh, with the copyright and, and establish what was the state of that copyrighted product at a given point in time, which is important if you want to enforce your rights of intellectual property. The idea here is, therefore, because we don't have such a register, is to create a digital fingerprint of that work of art, this piece of music or that painting, and to hash it on the blockchain, to have an immutable, auditable track on what was the state of a work of art at the moment it was copyrighted. Another interesting use case that is being developed here is the use of blockchain technologies to prevent counterfeiting, counterfeiting of trademark protected, design protected products in supply chains. It's a big problem for the European luxury industry is that a lot of our branded products are being copied uh, and, 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 and counterfeited. Here, the idea would be to connect intermediaries, right holders, enforcement agencies, and the manufacturers of these branded goods on one blockchain to prevent fraud. And then finally, we already have a trademark and designs IP register in operation on a blockchain since April 2021. So I'm bringing all these examples only to show that in Europe, we are really trying to make of blockchain technology more than just a cryptocurrency technology. I think that's one of the messages I would like to pass. Four years ago, when I stood here and I talked about initial coin offerings, some of the engineering department experts, academic scientists asked me, so, where do you think is the potential of distributed ledger technologies beyond cryptocurrencies? Is it just a technology for speculations? The more into it, I would dare to say today, the answer is yes, it is a technology that has a big potential, uh, in particular in the public sector. If you're interested to learn more about our research, our work in blockchain technologies, distributed ledger technologies in Europe, please have a look at the website of our think tank, European Blockchain Observatory and Forum. It has since over the last four years been publishing on a bi-monthly -month, bi basis, a thematic report about blockchain in the European Union for instance, blockchain applications in the healthcare sector published only in February 22. It's quite recent, very interesting publication. Have a look at it. 
And if you're more interested into the financial areas of application, there is a publication about central bank digital currencies and the digital euro. It's a big project on which we're working at the moment as a report there as well, giving you some insights. Next slide, please. So we also think that to make most of blockchain technologies, we need to, if you could push the buttons, we need to bring together stakeholders, not only in Europe, but also outside of Europe. This is why the European Commission has facilitated the creation of a global platform, the INATPA, International Association for Trusted Blockchain Applications, a terribly long word. <laughs> We're good in inventing acronyms. <laughs> Founded in April 2019, has 160 companies today already. But what's more interesting, this is not just a trade organization, if you could the other buttons. It also has a governmental advisory board where we have a lot of the UN organizations already. We have the World Bank, WTO, and more than 50 members from governments. So for instance, from the United Arab Emirates, from Japan, from, from, from Australia, from South Africa, representative experts of blockchain technologies that meet with us virtually uh, every month to discuss the potential of blockchain technologies beyond cryptocurrencies and also cryptocurrencies, the regulatory challenges in order to coordinate the regulatory approach to cryptocurrencies. The United States of America are also in this board represented by one of the Federal Reserve Banks in the Reserve Bank system, but we would certainly appreciate to see more governmental agencies from the United States of America to join that global forum, which works together with the European Union on a regulatory framework and on making more blockchain technologies than uh, just for cryptocurrencies. We can go to the next slide. Now, now I'm coming to the hard bit. This is the regulation, so fasten your seatbelts. So I'm trying to make it quick. You can look at the slides for more details afterwards. You can ask me questions if you want to have more details. Regulation always goes into the nitty gritty of it. But I think what I would like to pass on with that section is that Europe has really gone through a two years thought process on how to regulate cryptocurrencies in a meaningful manner without destroying and hampering innovation, but at the same time providing sufficient protection to investors and to consumers that want to uh, invest in crypto assets. And this balancing exercise is something where we are probably a little bit ahead of the USA. We're also discussing regularly with our colleagues at US agencies. I think it has been recognized that here Europe has a leading role. So I would just like to do a little bit of a deep dive into this. And then if you say it's too much, then you interrupt me and we move on to other bits. Um, so this was too much, yeah. The markets in crypto asset regulation, another nice acronym, MICA, the MICA has been proposed as a piece of legislation in the European Union in April last year. The European Commission, as you know, proposes legislation. Then it goes through a long process of vetting by the European Parliament, by the European Council. That process is ongoing, but it is probably possible to finish this process still until the summer. So this legislation might become law by the summer of this year. What I'm presenting to you today is the original proposal of the European Commission, which will certainly undergo changes as Parliament and Council find a compromise on our proposed text. What are the principles of this regulation? The high level principles are to create one harmonized set of rules for all 27 member states. And why is that so important? Is because in the area of financial regulation, we have traditionally not fully harmonized the law. Member states still retain a lot of powers to regulate, for instance, securities. Now, if every of the 27 governments has a different concept of when crypto assets qualify as a security, then the same startup issuing one digital asset in Germany might be under penalty infringements on criminal infringements in other member states for selling securities that are not authorized in that member state. 
So to prevent that, we are proposing one single harmonized framework for crypto assets in the entire European Union. It's about legal certainty. Second big principle is the passport principle and the one-stop shop. So that's a principle that comes from financial regulation. You know that in the European Union, if you're licensed as a bank in one country, you may also offer services in other countries. The same logic should apply here. If a startup wants to issue cryptocurrencies, or if a large corporation like Facebook wants to issue cryptocurrencies in the European Union, they have to find one country that is the host country, get cleared by that financial supervisor. And if that clearance has happened, they may offer these crypto assets in all European member states. It's a one-stop shop principle. Other principles, very important. We want to have a clear taxonomy of crypto assets. Why is that important? Because crypto assets are very different animals. They can be digital representations of works of art, or they can be a security like stock equity. So if you look at these two extreme examples, you already see that the risks attached to crypto assets are fundamentally dependent on how the software, essentially it's a software, piece of software, is programmed, what the features are, what the rights are attached to that. This is why we said we need a taxonomy for crypto assets. We need to classify them according to risks, and we need to calibrate the regulation according to these risks. And finally, and that's also something that was noticed with great interest in our discussions with US interlocutors so far, we have also created safe areas, carve-outs, exemptions, where startups know that if they fall in this, in this pot, if you want, the crypto assets that they're issuing here are only subject to a very limited number of obligations related to transparency. And we'll come to that in a moment. This is in particular about these famous NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, and the so-called utility tokens, which give holders a right against a particular platform, a particular ecosystem to obtain services from that platform, but have no utility outside that ecosystem. Oops, I think that's one too far. Yeah. Also, high-level principle, what's in the scope of the regulation, what's not in the scope of the regulation? In the scope of the regulation are all crypto assets not yet covered already in financial regulations. So we are closing the regulatory gap here. And what is covered? It's those providers that operate in the European Union. That's an important element. Now, what that means, we will hear later. If you make an offering, of crypto assets to consumers in the European Union, you are deemed to operate in the European Union, okay? What is not in the scope of MICA is financial instruments that are already regulated, e-money and central bank digital currency. So this is the project of the digital euro by the European Central Bank is not subject to that regulation, be subject to specific other regulations. I'm going a little bit faster now in the interest of time and the discussion. So what the regulation introduces is a basic distinction between stable coins and other crypto assets. But why are these stable coins singled out? Now, stable coins are crypto assets that are linked to one or more specific assets to create a stability of value. And that stability of value is extremely important for a crypto asset to take on the features of real currency. Bitcoin, as you know, is fluctuating a lot. The value changes six, 7% every day. A currency can't work with such fluctuations. This is why today Bitcoin is almost not used in retail shops, almost not. However, US dollar C, Tether, and other stable coins that have almost always the same value can really become a digital asset, a digital asset, it is like a fiat currency in the e-commerce and digital economy. So that requires very specific attention. And therefore, we have said for this type of coins, we want a license regime. You can only issue them in Europe and distribute them and trade them if you are licensed. 
and the license has to be given by a financial regulator. To the contrary, the other crypto assets, a much lighter issue, you just have to notify these assets to a financial regulator. You don't need the ex ante approval. You need the ex post notification. I'm going to do this. And you have to publish a white paper and the other rules that will come into place. Here's the definition of what a crypto asset is a utility token. I jump through that. You can look at it later if you're interested in the details. What's important is the transparency principle. We are making the white papers compulsory for issuing crypto assets in the European Union. It's a practice that has already existed since 2009, 10, that startups publish white papers, but we're standardizing them and we're setting content requirements. Next one. This is the carve outs and exemptions I referred to. You see that utility tokens, the non fungible tokens, have been exempted from the obligation of publishing a, a white paper. Now that's quite far reaching exemption at them. If you think of it, you, you sell a utility token. You don't even need to publish a white paper in the European Union, but the concept of utility token is defined narrowly. So you will have to look at the definition to know what falls under it. A lot of what companies call utility tokens would not fall under the narrow definition of utility token that we have provided in our draft form. But this is very interesting here because these non-fungible tokens are about tokens that represent digitally a piece of art, for instance. Have you heard about people who has auctioned with Sotheby's a digital fingerprint of the, what was it, the first 500 days? I mean, the auction was a big success. People became a multimillionaire through that one auction. This is the type of non-fungible tokens we're talking about. They're unique, they cannot be like Bitcoin mixed with others. They're just representing one asset. But if that asset is very valuable, it can also be financially important. Nevertheless, we're saying because it's unique and we don't see the systemic risk here for the financial markets as for other assets, we are granting this wide going exception. That's a proposal again of the European Commission. We have to see what comes out of the legislative process. Stable coins, I'll be a little bit faster here. There are basically two categories of stable coins that we distinguish. Those that, rep, those that are stabilized by one fiat currency only, a digital euro, a digital dollar, and the other stable coins that represent a basket. The reason why there is a distinction between the two is that the assumption is that it is riskier for stability of markets to have stable coins that reference the European Union circulating European Union than those that reference gold or reference other assets. Importantly, before national authorities allow and license the issuer of a stable coin in the European Union, they have to conduct a very wide consultation. They have to consult the European Banking Authority, the European Securities Markets Authority, the European Central Bank, and where a union currency, which is not a euro, is included in reserve, also the central banks, which is basically the Swedish Central Bank. They are very fine as well. So this far-reaching consultation has, of course, as its purpose to assess the risk of a stable coin comprehensively, while at the same time also assessing the potential. These are, I listed the obligations of all issues of crypto assets, to be honest, fair, and pro act professionally, to market in a fair and transparent manner the crypto asset, not to lie about the potential of the crypto asset, not to promise, you know, the, the blue sky, but to remain sober. These are all requirements that you will find in our European regulation. Importantly, there are, of course, also then obligations on the reserve. If you stabilize a crypto asset with a reserve, if the reserve is worth nothing, but the company issuing that stablecoin promises that the reserve is sufficiently strong to stabilize the value, there's an enormous potential of harm for users, of course. This is why we have this list of requirements for what the assets in the reserve actually have to, have to live up to in order to stabilize, to back up that stable coin. 
slide. This doesn't work. I think I'll jump over that. Um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So what I would like to still talk about, this is the concept of the significant stable coin. So within these categories of stable coins, we have a subdivision of stable coins that we call the significant ones, because we realize that certain stable coins are still very small, they're nascent. Therefore, we don't want immediately to impose all these heavy licensing requirements. But those that are specifically tag the significant by the European uh, banking authority, those have specific rules on the reserves, as we've seen, on the investment of the uh, reserves, but they also have to an orderly wind down plan because what happens if the currency stops operating? What, what happens with these assets? What happens with people that hold the tokens? Do they have a right to ask, I would like to have you know, something that's valuable, almost like their one US dollar in exchange for my crypto asset? How would that work? So this plan has to be published. There has to be an orderly wind up plan and a possibility for uh, issues for consumers to redeem the token in exchange for the currency that it uh, references. Yeah, I also brought a few slides about other European uh, legislation on blockchain technologies. This is in particular a, a very recent proposal. It's about defining a concept of distributed or electronic ledger in order to set a certain standard for what a distributed uh, technology, uh, le distributed ledger tech, can you, yeah, thank you, should, uh, should live up to in order to benefit from the legal presumption that the data entries in the ledger are chronologically correct order. That's very important for the financial sector in particular. Go to the next slide. And then we also propose uh, legislation on standardization of what smart contracts are about. You know that smart contracts are um, since 2014 um, and an element that has created a lot of traction for blockchain technologies because by combining automated uh, computer programs, smart contracts with the blockchain, we have so Ethereum has essentially enabled a lot of innovation that builds on the automation of transfer of data and of funds. So we are proposing one standard for smart contracts as well in the European Union for that. And these are the essential requirements. You can take a look at them thereafter. So that was a brush, brush through, uh, through the, um, through the um, regulatory uh, parts of our policy. And I would like to say a few words about the environmental aspect. As you may have heard, blockchain technologies and some blockchain technologies in particular have a carbon footprint that's almost comparable to the electricity consumption of mid-sized countries such as Spain or uh, Belgium. This is in particular true for proof of work. Now, in the European Union, over the last six to 12 months, a political momentum is building up to do something about the carbon footprint. Because you know, it's very much like the United States of America, we try to fight climate change. Now, in this process of legislating on crypto assets for financial reasons, members of parliament in the European parliament have said, why don't we use this piece of work, this piece of legislation to prohibit simply one way of creating crypto assets, which is proof of work. A proof of work is the blockchain technology, if I may put it in simple words, that underpins Bitcoin. So very quickly, this was understood as a war cry to ban Bitcoin in the European Union. And the discussions in Parliament have been very dynamic and very tense. And at the end, in a very, very close vote, two votes of difference, the ban of Bitcoin was essentially set aside and replaced with a softer measure, which is a proposal to instruct us, the European Commission as the executive branch, to work out legislation that would reduce the financial incentives to invest in these crypto assets that have a particularly bad impact on, the, on our climate. 
So that softer solution is now continuing in the legislative process, and we're going to see what comes out of it. Europe hosts approximately 8 to 10% of the crypto miners in the, in the world. And after China banned proof of work mining, a lot of those miners relocated, and some of them relocated to Northern Europe, to Sweden, for instance, because of hydropower, which has exacerbated the problems and the discussion. However, in terms of the climate and carbon footprint, it's not eight to 10%, but you are probably at three to 4% because in Europe, miners a lot use renewable energy more than gas-fired power plant electricity. Just bringing you this as the full picture. So the latest discussion we really have in Europe is about, shouldn't we do something about this climate problem of crypto assets? And how do we distinguish between those assets that have a sustainable consensus mechanism and those that are like Bitcoin consuming a lot of electricity. What's the benchmark we should use? How do we scientifically underpin it? And how can we then link this to legislation that reduces financial incentives to invest in a particular environmental problematic crypto assets? So if I can sum this up in a few words, what I've been saying is that first, the European Commission believes that Blockchain technologies are more than only a technology to underpin crypto assets. We have seen a lot of interesting developments in the public sector and we're supporting those. Second, for using blockchain technologies in finance, we need a solid set of rules that's consistent, that's harmonized across the European Union and that we hope will also provide inspiration to other jurisdictions. We're looking in particular to our US partners for cooperation in this area. And then the third big point that I wanted to make is there is a need to think about the climate impact of certain, I underline certain blockchain technologies that are really harmful to the environment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Lucas, for a very interesting, very clear, very important lecture, I would say. Uh, we're now opening uh, our discussion and we have people on Zoom participating in the discussion. So if you are on Zoom and you have a question for Lucas, please write your question in, in the chat function and we will uh, pass on your question. Uh, but I will give the first question to our co-moderator, to Annie Hellman. And uh, so please, Annie, um, first question for Lucas. Thank you. So may, maybe you come here so that the, mm -hmm. the Zoom people can see you. I have so many questions, so I have to choose now which one to ask. And I want to ask a, a very general question. Yes. So um, <clears throat> EU wants to, um, and it has two parts, EU wants to regulate um, the uh, cryptocurrencies, the, the blockchain. Is it um, because we want cryptocurrencies into Europe, so we want to encourage it? Or is it because it's inevitable and they are coming anyway, so we need to regulate them? So that's the first part. And the second part is that if you look from now 10 years ahead, what do you estimate the role of cryptocurrencies to be? So two brilliant questions, and uh, I'll try to stay short in answering them, but it will be difficult because they require some attention. I think, first of all, why did we propose regulation on crypto assets? The first question, the why. And I think it's driven by two motivations. The first one is that crypto assets have come to the European Union, whether we want it or not. They're here, they're reality. They are decentralized financial technologies. Europeans are buying them. Actually, the first wave of crypto assets, the initial coin offerings in 2014 15, European Union was even investing more into crypto assets than in America in the first period. So first answer to your question is definitely yes, because this is a phenomenon that came to Europe. A lot of investors invested. The question therefore is, do we need to protect these investors? Do we need to protect households investors in particular? The answer is yes. The second leg to the answer is innovation. If European startups are to be successful in this area of blockchain innovation, be it in crypto assets, be it in areas related to them, 
then they need to have legal certainty. And one of the challenges we have in the European Union is that we have 27 different national regulators. So we have had in 2014-15, when I still worked at the, at the Institute here as a research fellow like you did, we had the situation that I remember a Danish startup that had the clearance from the Danish regulator to conduct an initial coin offering under the national financial rules as a non-financial asset, but then heard later on that in another very large neighboring member state of the European <laughs> Union, the financial <laughs> regulator had a very different opinion about that asset. And um, the um, French financial authority once conducted a survey of all the crypto assets offered to French investors and compared how many of them were subject to existing financial regulations. And they found out it was about 20, 25% only. Yeah. 75% of the crypto assets were not caught by regulation. So there was a big regular and is still a big regulatory gap until that regulation is adopted. And so related to that question is how do we strike the balance? Because we want to induce innovation, but we also want to grant sufficient protection. And I hope it came out a little bit in my presentation that by this categorization of crypto assets and stable coins and other coins, we're trying to strike that balance. The downside of that approach is, of course, with every classification is what is happens with hybrid tokens, because some tokens have characteristics of two. That's an area that needs to be still further discussed to clarify, which is why we have the regulatory settings. The second question. It was about if you look at the crypto assets now and 10 years Thanks. from now, where will we be? So again, my personal opinion, no official position of the European Commission. I think crypto assets are here to stay as a phenomenon, as an institution, as an innovation. Four years ago, when I was here, I discussed this question vividly with academics on the campus. And they told me this is this is basically a tulip market. It's a big bubble. It's built burst and it's gone. Don't waste your energy in researching that. Four years later, we have seen a burst of the bubble in 2018 and a resurgence and doubling, tripling of the market size in 2020-2021. Why? Because it's a way of investment that is easy for people that although it's technically difficult, once you're into it, to expose yourself, to gain investment and to, to, to invest in startups in particular is very interesting for young people. This element of speculation certainly adds to it, but it is something that can also change business models. I've only recently heard about a new browser that has come out, which is very performant, but to compete against established browsers, being performant alone is not enough, so this browser developer had the idea of saying, I'm using cryptocurrencies to induce the use of my server, of my browser. If you browse with it and you accept to view advertisements, I'm going to reward you with a utility token every time you look at an advertisement. It's a completely new business model. You couldn't run this with a dollar every time transfer with a bank wire, $0.5 <laughs> for viewing an advertisement. I mean, imagine the cost. But with a crypto asset, you can do that. So they're collecting these utility tokens and after a year, you can change them against the Bitcoin. And if you want to change them later against the dollar, you can then cash in on your patience to view advertisements. But the idea of the startup to say, I take this business model of a browser and then co connect it with this crypto asset to change the way we look at the commercialization of advertisements was very interesting and I found that's why I believe the innovation potential of blockchain technologies is there. How in 10 years the market will look like, I mean, in detail, is very hard to predict, but I think that we will still see crypto assets in two years, in 10 years from now. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucas. Um, let's see if we have any questions from people who are following us on Zoom, uh, Ray, and maybe you can pass on one of those questions yes. to Lucas. We do have one question from the audience, um, a bit more of a technical question. 
Um, what benefits does the untrusted peers distributed consensus model of blockchain bring over simpler centralized and new governance or trusted peer distributed consensus model? That's a technical question. Yes. <laughs> uh, so first of all, again, I'm a lawyer by background, but I think in general, in general terms, there are there are there are that basically the idea of the distributed ledger technology is to do away with the middleman, the intermediary. And the middleman is someone who takes a fee for his services, for the risk exposure. Think of a bank that issues commercial bank money, e-money, takes deposits. That's an activity that needs to be rewarded. The initial idea of, of Bitcoin was to cut out that middleman and to allow peers and peers to interact directly. So the cost of using the bank falls away. Now with this falling away of the middleman comes a lot of other issues that need to be addressed. But that's the idea. So the efficiency of using the distributed consensus mechanism for assets, for digital assets, is to save the trust fee that the intermediary earns, essentially. Now, I'm now moving outside the financial sector. Where is the distributed trust consensus mechanism of the blockchain also more efficient than the centralized approach. If you look at supply chains, in supply chains you have a large number of actors that are independent of one another, cannot trust one another, but still need to rely on one trusted source of information about where products are along the supply chain, how they're being processed, um, what values added to them, uh, in which temperature they are, et cetera, et cetera. And here, if you would use a centralized database to update the information, first of all, the question is who of the many, many, many players in the supply chain would manage that central database and would have the key to change the information on the database? Whom do I trust as a trust problem? You can solve the trust problem in the supply chain by saying everyone along the chain has a key, a right permission to add data subject to certain conditions and controlled by the other nodes, but everybody can write and do it. And that efficiency is enormous if you think of it, because you have one single source of truth that's updated automatically the moment information is imputed. Everybody else in the supply chain can see that. And compared to the centralized database also solves the trust problem. So this is where outside the financial sector, I would say there's an enormous efficiency. Now, let me also be clear on one thing. I'm not a believer that blockchain is a solution to everything. Um, I think that blockchain has its specific areas of use where it can be very efficient. And there are many, many other areas where it has been hyped, but where centralized database, traditional database technology, hub and spoke technologies are more efficient. And we've seen that during the hype cycle of 2014, uh, and then now uh, and up to 2018, and, 19 to 21, there have been attempts to use blockchain for everything, put the word blockchain on everything also. And these attempts eventually, of course, then die off and these startups disappear, new forms of innovation come. But I would like to say that as in other technologies, we see that technologies go through a hype cycle and then they mature. And then what remains of them can be very powerful. Look at how the internet evolved. And we've had the dot-com bubble that bust, a lot of startups disappeared. And then suddenly we have these big mega platforms that emerge and they create a lot of efficiency, but also problems. So blockchain technologies are still, I would say at the down, down cycle of this hype, uh, hype uh, cycle, we will see more interoperability between blockchain technologies in the future. And with this more interoperability between the blockchain technologies, I would also expect that the market will mature more and we'll see more, more efficiencies. Okay. Let me turn to, to the audience, see if there's any questions. I think Lily, you had a question. Yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I have a question that kind of goes off of the question from the chat. Um, so you mentioned that the EU or the EU Commission values blockchain technology uh, beyond cryptocurrency purposes. And you highlighted this as a difference uh, from the US a little bit. Uh, and I am wondering if, Right, just now you, you highlighted as one of the advantages to solve the trust issue. 
And you also mentioned that in the public sector, blockchain technology is being you know, applied or tested. And I'm wondering whether, is it that in the European Union, we need to solve this trust issue because the European governments aren't trusting each other well enough to be able to use centralized technology? Uh, or are there other purposes, uh, other advantages that you see, especially for the public sector among the European Union member states? Uh, or is there a different reason why the US wouldn't uh, consider it as valuable as the EU uh, for you know, cooperation among the states in the US and the member states? It's a very good question. Very good question. I think it's, it's probably due to two reasons. The first one is that is a commercial economic one. So in the, in the United States of America, technological innovation is basically market driven. What is potentially profitable is where the market moves. And sometimes it moves in these hype cycles, which are stronger here than in, in Europe. Because it's so market driven, the public sector in the United States of America, to my understanding, leans back and waits what the market delivers. And then what remains is the one, the, the innovations that they would probably also embrace for the private sector. But the public sector doesn't see itself as a trailblazer of technological innovation in America. It's a different mindset. Coming back to your first proposed answer to the question, whether we have a particular trust problem. I would say that Having 27 national governments in the European Union, typically the coordination problem between the 27 has been solved so far by giving a task to the European Commission to tell the solution to the 27 and to facilitate the solution. The nice aspect of blockchain technologies is that you can have this shared governance and this shared management of a database which then creates also more buy-in from member states because they feel themselves being the driving seat. Whereas the classical solution of saying, we need a coordination, we need an IT tool, let's ask the commission to create it and have the commission run it, is, is a solution which still works in many areas, but the blockchain technology gives you this additional government, government solution that is very interesting. And which is why the 27 member states have said, let's come together and work together as one team, a large team, but one team on creating this blockchain uh, services infrastructure. So to, to answer to your question, my personal opinion, two reasons. One is the mindset, public sectors, trail place of innovation in Europe, less so in America. And the second one is, yes, indeed, there's this advantage of having a shared governance solution uh, between 27 governments, which is different probably not fully different, but a little bit different to the United States, where we also have the state and federal level, uh, but probably more of a common uh, common uh, trust culture when it comes to, to public administration. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chris, I saw you had a question. Yeah, uh, wow, this is very important. <laughs> I, I know now, I now know a hundred times more than I did before, uh, but that shows how little I did. Uh, I guess one question I have is about the future too. So you have 27 member states and you're trying to set up regulations concerning all sorts of blockchain, including crypto. Can you imagine a situation in which that regulation discourages innovation and essentially drives away, uh, you know, participation within the EU member states. Okay. Second part of that question is, what do you do when somebody drops out? We want to assume that's possible. Uh, what happens, how do you prevent the sort of beggar by neighbor strategy of saying, oh, we can we can get a corner on the market here in Budapest uh, on this very latest Bitcoin iteration. Uh, you know, what, does this have a threat to the integrity of the EU? So um, just to repeat the question, the question was about whether we are concerned that by being a front run and regulation, the European Union at the same time 
drives out innovators out of Europe. And what happens if one member state drops out of the European Union with like with Brexit, whether there is then a beggar thy neighbor uh, problem or risk uh, that this one dropping out members that would attract all the innovators by dumping in a way the regulatory uh, protection. Um, so I think that if you want to have sustainable innovation, a technological innovation, you do need to have a regulatory framework which provides the appropriate balance. And in the long run, striking that balance right will pay off. In the short run, having a serious comprehensive regulatory framework might drive out some of the innovators that thought they could cut corners, perhaps market the crypto assets in a way that over promote what they're all about. It might drive out some of the bad actors. I would say fine with that. I have no problem with that personally. I think those that will remain in the European Union are those that have a long-term potential and serious players also from the United States of America, uh, big players are approaching us already and saying, thanks God you have a comprehensive framework because it now will provide us with the legal certainty that we do not have elsewhere. Because in other jurisdictions, it depends on the opinion of one authority which interprets one Supreme Court judgment that dates back 60 years and we don't know what that asset actually is. Full stop. Closing my parenthesis. Um, on, the, on the question of uh, the Brexit, I, well, I think we, the European Union hopes, of course, that another Brexit situation will not arise. Eh? So we, we assume that this was an, an exceptional uh, situation driven by uh, exceptional circumstances at the time and the 2015 refugee crisis, which led to fears of, of mass immigration uh, that were exploited, in my view, uh, by, by populists. Um, but I mean, if you, if you would think that it pays off to go below the requirements of the European crypto asset regulation to dump, so to say, as a non-EU member state, that will always be the case. You will always have these countries, but that will not help innovators that would like to sell crypto assets and distribute them in the European Union. Because the moment they're selling those in the European Union, the EU regulatory framework applies. So if they have no license and they want to distribute a stable coin in the European Union, the preference is the euro and establish themselves in your third country, that's no reason why financial regulators would not clamp down on them. Because if you distribute them to our consumers, our rules apply, our protection level applies, whether or not you're established in Europe. I think we have one more minute, maybe for a last question from the Zoom. Yes. Um, what are the most important negative externalities in crypto market that the regulations intend to address? A rather large question. <laughs> so a negative externality, investor protection. So one of the problems that we currently have in the unregulated, I told you that about 75% of crypto assets being distributed in the European Union are at the moment falling in this gray area where there's no regulation. So there is no restriction on how to market them. There's no requirement of a white paper, what the white paper should look like. That's a big negative externality for the investor, for the household investor, for the average person that wants to um, wants to expose itself and invest in crypto assets. That externality uh, is gone. Another aspect we talked about environmental protection, a very development of the last six months is this question whether crypto assets that are built with proof of work should be distributed in the European Union. A big ne negative externality of proof of work is the impact on climate. So I would also say that with this mandate to the European Commission to find a way to reduce financial incentives to proof of work in the European Union, uh, that would be another uh, negative externality that this legislation would start to tackle, although gradually in a multi-step approach. Um, I'm thinking about other negative externalities. I also see a lot of positive externalities that this legislation will internalize by providing legal security. Hopefully, we will see. Uh, more sustainable blockchain innovation, more long-term crypto asset innovation, 
and less uncertainty by investors operating in the European Union. That's a big positive externality, which we also try to reap not only uh, integrating uh, the negative externalities. Yeah. Thank you for this. Thank you so much, uh, Lucas. Uh, we just heard the clock, the carry-on is playing on the Berkeley campus. So which is always the sign that the speakers yeah. talk too long. <laughs> Let me uh, thank you, Steve. Let me first uh, start by thanking the people on Zoom, also the people who follow this live stream on YouTube. Of course, I also wanted to thank people who came and attended this event in person. A uh, big thank you also to Annie Hellman for co-moderating, uh, to Ray Severt for organizing all this event behind the scenes. But of course, the biggest thank you of all goes to Lucas Repa uh, for an excellent presentation. I think all of us will learn quite a lot. Also wanted to thank you, Lucas, for being such a good friend. It's, of our it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. <laughs>